recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. And I've got Michaela here with me. Um, if you all, if you all can um, tap, type into the questions or the chat box um, and let us know if you're having trouble hearing us at all. Um, we would like to know that so we can adjust anything um, and adjust microphones and that sort of thing. But um, otherwise, we're going to start in just a second here once I hand the controls over to Michaela because she's going to start us off. There she goes. There you go, Michaela. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. So today we are going to be talking about how to take your art to the next level. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Michaela Cristello from ForTheCreators.com, and on the line we also have Laura. Um, and yep. today we're going to be discussing how to bust creative blocks and work your art the smart way. Great. So we'll just do some brief introductions first. Um, so I'm Michaela. I run a website called For The Creators. Um, some of you are probably members of For The Creators and some of you have come across from Laura and some of you have just found us online uh, when we've been talking about this webinar. And I write about the creative process um, and uh, everything to do with that. So in terms of uh, doing your best work every day, inspiring you and motivating you to show up to your daily creative practice. And uh, Laura might like to introduce herself now as well. Sure, um, I'm Laura and online I go by Laura C. George, um, mostly just because that's the URL I could get. Um, and I am a business consultant for artists. So um, most of you are creative in some manner and I typically help um, a range of different creative types. Um, and I like to help you with the more logistical side of things um, than the more emotional side that Michaela covers. Um, so we kind of thought that we played off each other pretty well, um, being that I'm more practical tips. So <laughs> that's where we both um, come from in this online world. Okay, great. So now we are going to look at what we're covering today. So we're looking at how to bust creative blocks and work your art the smart way. And we're looking at, firstly, why creatives get stuck. So you probably have an idea of why you get stuck, but we're going to look at it in a bit of a different way um, and try to work out exactly what's happening. Sorry about that. Um, okay, um, then we're going to look at how to get unstuck and take things to the next level um, by looking at a few different gaps, uh, the belief gap, the knowledge gap, and the action gap, which we'll be going through in lots of detail with both Laura and I sharing our insights on that. And then at the end, we're going to have time for questions. So if you've, got, if you've got any questions at all during the webinar today, you can type them into the questions and chat box on your right of your screen, I believe, or maybe your left. I'm not sure. Um, and we'll answer those at the end. So just wait till the end. We'll answer them. And if you have any questions at the end as well, you can also chat, type them into the chat box. And we're hoping to answer everyone's questions live on the call today. So thank you for joining us, everyone. It's great to see so many people showing up live today. And let's get started. So why do creatives get stuck? Uh, we're going to look at four big areas today. So there's the belief gap, which is um, briefly, it's about not believing in yourself. It's about um, having things like self-doubt, um, inner critics. Sorry, I'm not quite sure what's happening with the slides here. Um, they seem to be going back and forth, so just bear with me. Um, so we have the belief gaps, so it's about inner critics, it's about self-doubt and everything that might be holding you back. Um, which we're going to explore in a minute. Uh, then we've got the skills gap, which um, is about um, basically lacking the skills to do your art, which I'm hoping is not the case for anyone here today, and I don't think it is. Um, then we've got the action gap. So that's about what you're doing daily. So what you're doing in your creative practice every single day, whether you're showing up. And then we've got the knowledge gap. 
um, which is Laura's area of expertise. Um, and it's really about knowing how to take things to the next level. So do you have that essential uh, business and marketing knowledge to know how to really work your art beyond what you're doing daily in the studio? Yeah. So how to take, sorry, Laura, did you have Those were good, Michaela. <laughs> So um, how to get unstuck and take things to the next level. So basically we need to bust through the gaps. So we know you've got the skills, I know you do, but you might be missing some of the others. So we're gonna look at the belief gap, the knowledge gap and the action gap today. And Laura and I are gonna take you through those um, and look at how you might get past each of them. So I'm gonna cover the belief gap first. Um, which is something I talk a lot about in my writing on For the Creators. I'm tackling it every week. Um, and I think that's a result of me having tackled these issues in the past and still in my own work, because I think no matter how far along you are as a creative person, these things are always going to come up. So what happens when you don't believe? Nothing. And that's a really big problem, because if you don't believe in what you're doing, how can you expect anyone else to believe? So creative beliefs form the core of how we create and how successful we are. So that makes them so important to get right. And I think many creators really get stuck at belief and it often stops them from going any further, getting any further from their art. It stops them from even showing up every day, which is really at the core of it. So we're going to look at this one first. So I think there are uh, three big areas in the belief gap. The belief gap isn't limited. Uh, to this, but there are three common traps that we do often fall into when creating. And it's the self-doubt trap, the perfectionist trap, and the comparison trap. So I'm sure some of you can relate to at least one of these. So the self-doubt trap is all about uh, basically feeling like you're not good enough, your work isn't good enough, uh, you're not sure if you can make things work, you're not sure if you can be successful. Uh, and it's, it's a really big problem I see with, with a lot of creatives out there. It's something I've uh, faced myself in the past and it can really hold you back from showing up every day. Then we've got the perfectionist trap, which is really about wanting things to be absolutely 100% perfect before you start or before you put your work out there. And it can really trap people because the truth is nothing is ever perfect. Nothing ever will be perfect. Um, but I think as creatives, we always want to put our best work out there. And when we don't feel like our work is the best, um, we, we really do feel held back and we don't want to show it to the world. And I think that really does come from, it comes from a good place within of uh, wanting to put forward our best work, uh, wanting to do our best, but we can often be really hard critics on ourselves. Uh, so that is a trap that I'm sure a lot of you fall into and it stops you, it holds you back by not putting yourself out there. Then we've got the comparison trap, which is really about comparing yourself to uh, other creative people, uh, which I find has been a really big one for me in the past. And even today, I, I, st I still struggle with it. You know, sometimes I see uh, other designers who have done really amazing work and it's hard not to compare yourself and your individual progress to them. Um, but it can really bring up a lot of negative feelings as well. So instead of being a source of inspiration, which is what you would hope comparing yourself to what someone else would be, it can actually become uh, a, you know, a real source of um, putting yourself down, um, having feelings of, of not being good enough, of never being good enough, and um, just of having really negative feelings around that other person and feelings of envy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I believe Laura is also going to cover a little bit on how you can use uh, comparing yourself to others in a really positive way later in terms of some more tactical business things. So how can we overcome these things? So I want to talk just briefly about a few things that you can do um, in the belief area. So I'm going to start with comparison. So the first thing I'd say if you're struggling with comparison is to accept that it's not a like for like comparison. So when you compare your creative work to someone else's creative work, um, you are not comparing like for like in that you are comparing the reality of your work and everything you understand to be true about it. So all of the best bits, all of the worst bits, all of your failures, everything that ha happens behind the scenes. And you're comparing that to someone else's highlights reel. So, you know, you're comparing it to their website and what they're showing online, um, which is not always going to be a really realistic um, uh, showing of their work, it usually isn't. People always 
try to put their best face forward as you do. Um, and so you're not seeing what really goes on in their work, you're not seeing their failures, you're not seeing behind the scene, and you're comparing your reality to their highlights. So it's not like for like. Uh, second thing I'd say is that you have to acknowledge that everyone is on their own path and you're probably at a different point in your creative journey. And um, your path is uniquely different to everyone else's. So it, it may be quicker, it may be slower, it may have different twists and turns. And you just have to accept that. Like everything in life, um, everyone is on their own path. Everyone has different experiences and you have to make the most of yours. And then number three, seek to learn to be inspired by others and learn from them instead of seeing it as a negative. Try to frame it in a positive way. How can you look at this person and uh, learn something from them? How can you be inspired by their work? How can you find it an uplifting thing instead of a negative thing? So they're my tips on uh, squashing comparison. Now moving on to perfectionism. So I think it's really hard to overcome perfectionist tendencies because you never want to put out work that you don't believe is good. Uh, but here are my tips to overcome it and I think that if you start implementing some of these I think the, the perfectionist tendency uh, will kind of be managed over time. So start right now without all of the information. So uh, I have experienced this very much so in the past when setting up my first creative business. I researched for about probably almost two years. I felt like I needed to know absolutely everything before I started. I had folders and folders of information. I had so many books on the subject. I'd written so many notes. I wanted to be 100% prepared. But what I found once I started was that there were so many things I didn't know, so many things that I didn't even know. I didn't know there was no way for me to research. There was no way for me to find out the answers until I actually started. And that taught me a really good lesson, um, is that some you, you never know all of the information, nothing is ever perfect. Um, and so the best thing to do is start right now and you're going to learn those things as you go along. It's great to do research. I'm not saying you shouldn't do research, but there has to be a limit to it. And um, there it comes a point where you have to start and just accept that you are going to learn things along the way and it's okay if it's not perfect. My second tip is to accept good enough. So this can be really hard to do, but I think often if we want to create work, we want to put it out there regularly and we want to make progress, we do have to accept good enough sometimes. So, um, you know, you can't spend 10 years working on your masterpiece and, um, you know, without, uh, without um, you know, putting it out there because otherwise, um, you're never going to get there. You're never going to be able to put your work out there because you're always going to be continually trying to perfect it, which is not a good thing. And then three, make a conscious mistake. So as hard as it might be when you're working on something, if you are feeling like you have perfectionist tendencies, make a mistake, try to make a mistake and see how you feel after that. Uh, you might not feel great at first, but I think it will help you to get past that in the long run. Now to self-doubt. So how can we squash self-doubt? Uh, put your work out there in a new way. So put it out there in a different way to what you've done before. So if you've traditionally shared online, uh, maybe you should try to show your work uh, offline uh, to people uh, in, in real life. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a new way to put yourself out there. And maybe uh, squash some of the assumptions that you have about the way people react to your work or what might happen if you do something new. Secondly, ask for feedback. So I think often as creatives, particularly when we haven't put our work out there very much, um, it can be very nerve wracking uh, to show your work and you kind of have a lot of uh, feelings about what someone else might think of it. And I think the best way to overcome this is really by asking for feedback. And um, I think often you'll find that the feedback isn't as negative as you thought. People are um, often uh, much kinder and your work is really often much better than you think it is. So ask for that feedback. And three, do one thing that scares you creatively today. So, um, you know, a lot of people probably sh shy away from this, but I think until you start doing things that scare you, uh, you're never going to get past your self-doubt uh, because as much as you, you know, might think about it in your head or try to justify it or rationalize it, um, if you 
don't do things that scare you, if you don't do things that um, are different and new and put your work out there in different ways, um, you're probably never going to get over those feelings of not enough. So I challenge you to do that if you're struggling with self-doubt. Now I am going to pass over to Laura, who's going to discuss the knowledge gap. So bear with us. I am just going to switch Laura over to the presenter so she can take control of the slides. Hold on a second, Kayla. I'm having trouble seeing that. There it goes. There we go. Let me get to the right slide. Can everybody see me all right? Michaela, do you see me? My, um, yes, I do. Yeah, slides. Okay. all good. Great. Um, so I wanted to talk about the knowledge gap, which, as Michaela said in the beginning of the presentation, um, it's the part where you don't actually know all the um, smarty pants ways you should be um, marketing your art or um, putting your art um, online and, and things like that. You don't know the um, tricks and tools of the trade. So that's absolutely crucial. There's got to be a place to pause this slideshow. Um, but it's absolutely crucial that you um, are able to, to learn these things. And I know that probably most of you have started learning a lot of these. You might even have learned um, most of them um, or feeling pretty confident in your business. Um, but it's kind of a consistent, ongoing process, I think. Um, because when you don't know how to work your art business, you're going to get stuck um, and you're going to get confused, just like you do when you've got a belief gap and you've got all these emotional mental blocks that are, that are you know, messing you up. Um, and uh, as it says on the slide, tackling the knowledge gap means learning what you need to know to fill the gap in marketing and business. And... Um, so I wanted to talk first about the competitors, which, of course, Michaela touched on how, you know, comparing yourself to people is, a, you know, not a very good idea. Um, and, it, and I agree with her completely. I think it, um, it really affects emotionally um, how you're feeling, which then in turn affects your work and makes you um, not as good at what you do um, and kind of makes it more difficult to get anything done. So it's definitely not good. But... <laughs> Typically, we all kind of do it anyway, at least a little bit. Um, and you've already put in probably a fair amount of time looking at your competition already. And so there's no need to let that all go to waste. Um, and so I like to say that when you've spent all this time thinking about your competition, um, you, you really figured out all these little things about your competitors, you know, how they price their work, what social media platforms they're using, their branding, things like that. Um, and all that information is really pretty useful. And you, mean, you don't want to be thinking, I'm not good enough because I don't have a thousand subscribers like, you know, Sally, and I don't have any Twitter followers and no one buys my work. You know, that, that's not good. But you do want to recognize that, you know, Sally or whoever this competitor is that, that you're worried about. Um, you, you want to recognize what helped her achieve the goals that you're hoping for. Um, you're looking to avoid the emotional comparisons um, and actually focus on the more practical comparisons, you know, so they're doing something that's put them into success. Um, and so instead of feeling really emotional, you know, they've got this and I don't, I'm an envious of them. You want to kind of wrap that into practicality. Okay, what are they doing that's really going to get me where I need to go? So um, let me give an example. If you really love their website, <laughs> Instead of being like, oh, you know, I'm so sad that my website looks nothing like this. You know, no one can possibly like my website. It's so ugly. You know, yada, yada, which we've all done. You know, we've all had stages where our website was just starting out and it looked awful and we were pretty miserable. Um, so instead of being all envious about it, um, why don't you pick out the things about this other person's site that are really captivating you? Um, employ them on your own site. So I'm a firm believer that when you copy someone else, you actually typically end up with something that's not like that original that you're copying. So you end up with your own unique work, as long as you're not trying to, you know, exact exactly what they're doing. Um, but you're not really stealing from them. You're just sort of using them as inspiration. Um, and that 
that can be good. Um, it ends up becoming your, your own wonderful piece of work um, through this process of mimicking something that you like um, in your own way. You know, it's like when you, um, and I'm sure a lot of you um, are artists and have from time to time drawn something, even if you're not a talented illustrator, that might not be your medium, but it's like if you draw something and you try to mimic, you know, a comic strip that you like and make it look just like that, you can never quite get that style. Yours doesn't look like their comics, but it becomes your own thing, you know, your own special thing. Um, and so I think that, that mimicking somebody is actually a really good way um, to utilize that competitor mindset, that feeling of being envious of your competition and of these people who are maybe further along in the game than you are, or maybe they aren't and you just perceive them to be. Like Michaela talked about um, seeing, comparing um, your everything to their highlight reel. Um, which was very on point. Um, and so, yeah, you can kind of harness what they're doing and, and apply it to your own business. And I think that works really well with a website. Um, identify that you love the way they position their photos on the homepage. Um, and so then get your photos positioned the same way. But you're going to keep your own colors and you're going to keep your photography style and you're going to keep your fonts and your header banner and all of that, you know, so your, your site doesn't look anything like theirs but you've stolen the way that they presented the, the photos, the way that they put their photos on the homepage or something. And that makes you feel better about your site without you stealing. Um, excuse that noise in the background. We've got a guest dog in our house and apparently it's not going so well, but my husband's over there taking care of it. So sorry for that. Um, yeah. So you're not copying, uh, or you're copying, but you're not stealing you know um it's kind of an in-between mode where no one's gonna be upset with you you're not gonna feel like you stole something it's not an ethical problem but it's helping you to achieve the reaction that you desire and achieve the results you're looking for um and you can do that with all sorts of things not just websites um if you know an artist who gets a ton of sales um and make sure that you know they really are selling you're not um you don't want to be comparing yourself to people who aren't actually selling just because you perceive that they might be. Um, you want to make sure that you actually know um, that they don't just have a bunch of Facebook likes, but that they actually are selling art um, or whatever it is that you sell. Because I know some of you on the line aren't artists. Um, so um, where am I? Yeah, so if you know an artist um, who's getting a lot of sales um, and you, you shouldn't just think, you know, that because their work is so good or because they have 6,000 Facebook likes or something, um, you know, you have to know that the artist is actually making money and um, you might be a little bit envious of them and try to go back to Michaela's teachings about being envious and try to avoid that because that mentality isn't very helpful for you. Um, but go ahead and analyze, like, where are they spending their time? Um, and you can't know everything because you're just getting the surface view, which, you know, we've talked about. Um, with Michaela uh, discussing that you're not seeing the whole picture, um, but you can probably tell like what they're doing online. You know, you can research, are they guest posting? Are they using Pinterest every day? Are they posting on Instagram? And these are like little strategies that you can kind of copy um, or use in your business as your own strategies that, and you can see how they help. Um, and so the way to do that right is to track everything. So you should start tracking your numbers right now. Um, I prefer Google Analytics. Um, and you should, it, it's much easier to see whether something's working if you've been tracking it before. So you should go ahead and install that now if you don't already have it. Um, Google Analytics is free um, and it just runs off of the Google account, which probably you all already have. Um, and it tracks what happens on your website. Um, and if you have like a, a shop like Etsy or Big Cartel or something, um, most of them also have a way for you to do this. So don't be nervous if you don't have a self-built site that you can't do this. Go ahead and check into it because most places have the ability to use Google Analytics. Um, and you should go ahead and track for about three weeks before you attempt any big new strategies that you want to see if they're working better. Um, you can you know, put things in place that you know are going to work better, but I wouldn't do anything new that you're not sure about. Um, and then once you've had about three weeks of tracking, you have some good numbers that are averages. Um, and you can use those for comparison purposes. So then you can go ahead and implement a new strategy, um, like try posting on Instagram every day if that's what your competitor does and you think it's like really working really well. 
um, then you can try that and try it for a minimum of like two months, you know, give it a really good old college try, you know, <laughs> really put effort into it um, and make sure that that you can kind of get to that average point where um, the initial the initial drought that you get when you try something new has kind of gone away. It gives you enough time, I guess, to gain momentum. Um, and then you can assess the numbers before and the numbers after. So you have the three weeks before you started that, um, or however long, if you've had Google Analytics for a while, you can compare a very long time before you tried posting on Instagram every day. Um, and then, you know, the two months after you can see, okay, where am I at now? You know, am I getting more um, website visits from Instagram? Um, are those people converting into customers? Are they buying things? And those kinds of things are really good to know. Um, and since you have the old numbers, you can compare these and see if Instagram actually helped you make more sales or if it just, you know, didn't do anything and you just happened to be making more sales or you um, can see if you aren't making more sales. Um, so if it isn't, if it doesn't make anything better, you know, if, if your experiment didn't really work, then you can move on from it. You can stop doing it and you can try something else. So this is a really good way to ensure that you're not putting too much time into something that's not working. Um, let's see. Then I think that's all I wanted to talk about with competitors. I'm looking through my notes just to make sure I don't leave you guys hanging on something that I meant to talk about. Um, yeah, so it's really just about um, making sure that you experiment and not being afraid to experiment. And I know a lot of people are a little nervous about that, but experimentation is kind of what, what it is in business, you know? It's always about trying things, seeing how they work, um, changing up when something stops working, that kind of thing. Um, so I also wanted to talk about outsourcing. Um, so outsourcing is when you allow someone else to do something in your business. It's pretty simple. It's like hiring someone, even if it's just for a one-off job, you know, paying someone to do something for you. And sometimes not even paying them if it's, you know, something that you can get for free somewhere. When you're focused on perfectionism, um, like Michaela talked about, it's really um, helpful <laughs> to pass things off to someone else that you trust um, to get it done well. So instead of being, you know, putting that pressure all on yourself, if you know that you can trust someone else, um, then you're not worried about it. You know, it helps put the project out of your head so that you're not wasting any more energy focusing on it. And then it usually gets done <laughs> and it actually usually gets done faster. Um, so it's important to have people that you trust on hand, especially if you have perfectionism tendencies and you're trying to combat them um, and have these people on hand that you know that you can trust for tasks. You don't necessarily need to hire them full time. You don't need to hire them part time. You can grab freelancers. You can grab interns um, for these little jobs that you need, you know, here and there as they come up in your business. And that's what I highly recommend, especially when you're starting out. You find someone you trust, um, and this could take a little bit of time. You might have to, you know, dedicate some effort to this <laughs> to find someone you trust in various fields that you feel weak in. So things like like tech fixes, I think, are kind of the nemesis of artists. <laughs> we tend to not be so good at that. Um, I know I hire out my tech fixes all the time, um, and so it's really important that you find someone that you trust for that if that's something that's really difficult for you, um, or that you find yourself kind of falling into the trap of spending way too much time on um, and you know someone else can do it can usually do it better and faster for you um, and so that might be worth outsourcing and other things like graphic design or copywriting or product photography or you know there's a there's a billion things you can outsource and it's all those things that you know whatever things that you feel you really aren't very good at um, or you aren't great at even things that you could do I'm um, like I can usually fix you know, probably 70% of my tech problems, but they stress me out and I'm not super great at them. They take me forever. Um, so it's much more um, efficient and helps my emotions to farm out that project to someone who is really good at technology and really loves it and can do it really quickly. Um, so basically, if you get fixated on something, you should outsource it. And stop worrying about perfectionism and worrying about everything, you know, being in order and let someone else take care of it. Um, and don't let that hold you back. You know, don't let those things that you're not good at hold you back. So one of the really great things about outsourcing is that you can still hold these high expectations that you have um, with, you know, perfectionist tendencies, or even if you don't quite have that, you can still have high standards in your business and you can hold those standards 
um, for the most part, but you don't have to spend all of your own time on that. You know, um, you only have 24 hours in the day and why not? Um, uh, as Laura Roeder said, you can pay someone else for their, for a few of their 24 hours, which I think was a great quote. Um, so, so this other person who's probably better at it if you found the right person and at least they enjoy it more, um, they can spend their time and their energy to get it right um, and to make it perfect. And you can trust them to do that and they're going to enjoy it. And, you know, you're kind of both supporting each other's passions. So I always think that that's very good. So the thing that usually comes up whenever I talk about outsourcing is how do you find someone that you trust? So I thought I'd make sure I covered that. <laughs> It's, it's kind of impossible um, if you shy away from being a business owner to, to outsource. So you really need to kind of conquer this. You need to confront this process just like you would confront hiring a full-time employee who would work like right next to you every day, like in an office or something um, or in your studio. Um, you need to make this, this you know, um, potential employee um, or even potential freelancer or whatever they are going to be, you need to make them fill out an application. Um, at the very least, you need to have them send you a resume. Um, and then you need to interview all the top candidates before you pick somebody. And you shouldn't feel bad about it because it helps them out too. You know, when you're doing this like hiring process, it's like a full blown out application kind of process. Um, it's actually helping them because they don't want to work for anybody who's a bad fit either. You know, while you don't want work them working for you if they're not a bad fit, if your personalities aren't going to work, if they're not going to be able to deliver what you want, they don't want to hate their boss. You know, they don't want to feel stressed every time that you give them a job, you know, um, they're kind of interviewing you too through this process. Um, so it's really good for you both that you don't enter into a relationship, a business relationship that um, you guys aren't happy with. You know, both parties need to be really happy about it. And the interview process sort of helps with that. Um, and you might actually offer the job to somebody and they can surprise you and say no, and that's okay. Um, you know, it's important to go through the process of hiring properly so that everyone can be happy. And so if they say no, when you were going to be happy with them, you actually wouldn't have been happy with them because they would have come in and they wouldn't have enjoyed the job. And then you would have felt like there was a drag there, you know, so both people have to perceive that it's going to be a good fit um, to have the best chance of it going smoothly. Um, the best employees and the best contractors are also rooting for your business in general. They like what you do and they want to be a part of your mission and not just get a paycheck. So I think that those are really important things to identify during the hiring process of application and interview. Um, so where do you find these people? <laughs> That's how you find someone that you trust, you know, once you've got people that you're looking for in this pool uh, of people. But where do you actually find the people to begin with? <laughs> um, so this is kind of very big. And I think that you need to find what you feel comfortable with. Um, because you can find people like, like, let me start with online. So you can find people online. Um, and networking is definitely the best way to find people online. Um, you might know somebody already through social media who can who can do the, your tech tasks for you or something like that. Um, and because they know you through social media, they're likely to be rooting for your business anyway. They're likely to already like you as a person. Um, and so they'll be the kind of person that will do well working for you. Um, because they're already rooting for you and your business. Um, but you might not find anybody like that. So you can also ask for references from the people that you know. So you might not know anybody directly, but your you know Facebook friend might have a Facebook friend who's perfect for, for the job. Um, so you can feel free to ask around. And people are used to that on social media now. And they're used to giving references and they actually enjoy it. Um, so feel free to just put out the feelers and ask. And if you have this hiring process in place where they have to apply, and or be interviewed, then it should go really well um, because you can get these references in. You know, people can tell you this person's perfect, but you don't have any sort of commitment. You know, there's no level of I've already, you know, this has to happen. You know, you don't feel guilty because you've got a process in place. Um, so yeah, make sure that they do go through that process. Now you can um, also search on sites. There are like websites dedicated to finding freelancers or employees. Um, with employees, there are job posting boards is what they're called. Um, I think like Monster is one of them and there's, a, there's others you can kind of Google around about it. I think that they tend to be more for corporate kind of things. Um, it's a little bit harder to find someone 
that's um, more creative, which most of you will probably be looking for, but they're also good if you want, um, especially, you know, if you want to make sure that they're going to be um, a reputable employee. Um, LinkedIn is good. That's kind of social media and kind of a job board. It sort of straddles um, in between the two. Um, and then for freelancers, um, I like Odesk and Elance. Um, and when we send out the recording, I'll make sure that there's some links to those sites for you. Um, those are both freelancer websites. Um, and you can find lots of good people on there. And I'm pretty sure that they're rated, if I remember correctly. Um, so you can kind of see what other people um, have experienced with those people before you um, offer them a job or before you ask them to apply. Um, and locally, offline, I mean, there's another way you can do it. And so you need to do what works for you. If you're feeling like online is kind of makes you nervous, you know, you won't know the person or something, you know, you can always do things in person. Um, Craigslist is a nice kind of not old fashioned quite yet, but kind of a little bit older way to do it. Um, and there are plenty of people looking for work on there that you can get help with. Um, and then you can go really old fashioned with flyers, which actually work really well. Um, you put them up at like local colleges and kind of community buildings, things like that, like the YMCA or, or something like that um, are really good places for them. Um, and there's always career fairs, which actually work really well, too. Um, those are good for finding interns. And those would be at high schools and colleges. Um, if you do get an intern, make sure you pay them. That's just a little side note. Um, unpaid interns are kind of a thing of the past. Um, and it's starting to um, breed a lot of resentment with interns. They expect to get paid, even if it's a nominal, you know, um, low minimum wage kind of position. Um, so to recap, online, offline are both fine. You need to find what you feel the most comfortable with. So I'm going to move on from outsourcing. I want to discuss systems and goal setting. This is one piece of the puzzle that I think that most people actually forget. Um, and really, it's kind of the most important part of your business. Um, if you don't have these in place, you're really going to struggle. Um, you have to be able to look at things from kind of an aerial view, a high level view. Um, where is your business going to be in five years? You know, um, it sounds a little scary, but how can you get where you want to go if you don't know where that is? Which I wrote on the slide because it's so important. <laughs> how can you get where you don't want to go if you don't know where you want to go is? It just doesn't make any sense. You know, you have to you have to have a map. You have to have a road a road map, a, a plan. Um, and even if that plan changes, even if the streets on the map change, you have to have something to start with, and then you can adjust it as you go along. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me grab a sip of water. When I talk too much, I get very dry throated. Okay. Um, so this like dreaming of the future, you know, where you are in five years kind of thing, it's really different for everybody. And that's okay. You might want to write down, um, like on a piece of paper, what a typical day looks like for you. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard that as a strategy um, that a lot of business consultants and business coaches um, suggest. And that might work for you. Um, or you might want to like list bullet points of milestones you've reached. Um, or milestones you hope to have reached, um, or you might have an income that you want to hit, or you might have some descriptive words of how you want to feel about your business. Um, you might want to draw it or paint it or sculpt it. <laughs> um, the point really is not how you come up with this vision for your business future. The point is that you're clear on where you're headed. So you can be clear in any way. And really, unless you're looking for investors um, or, or some weird thing like that, um, which most of you probably aren't, um, no one else really has to be clear on your long-term vision. It's just you. And you can let people in as needed. You know, you can kind of let them know a little bit about it, um, kind of in the shorter term. Um, or you can let them know longer term if you feel comfortable. But no one really needs to. No one needs to know where you want to be in five years. You know, you might actually um, have some people who need to know where you where you want to be in one to two years, like your lawyer or your accountant, maybe. But no one needs to know where you're going to be in the very long term, just you. So you shouldn't feel too nervous about it. And um, it's OK for it to change, too. So it really is um, a loosey goosey kind of thing. But you definitely need to pin it down to start with or you won't know where you're going. You won't know what to do to get where you want to go. 
So after you've nailed the long term, it's a lot easier to break down what needs to be done to get there. Um, let me give you an example. If you want to make like $60,000 a year, then you can know that there are numbers that you're going to have to hit before that. So maybe by year four, you'll need to be making 40K. Um, and maybe by near year two, you'd need to be making 10,000. Um, so that means that next year you'd want to be at like 5,000. Um, so those give you like little benchmarks, that working backwards concept. Um, and that progression feels a lot more friendly than aiming for the terrifying 60,000. Um, you can just year by year aim for something a little bit more achievable. Um, let me give you another one. Um, if you want your day to be structured a certain way, then you can slowly implement different pieces of that puzzle along the way. And this is kind of a different way of looking at it. Um, you can make decisions based on this end goal of knowing what your day wants to be like. So if your goal is to spend your mornings creating, then you can stop scheduling things during your mornings. And that can be like one big you know, step that you're making is to stop scheduling things during the mornings. And you can block that time out because you know you want to spend your mornings creating. And you can figure out how to get others to, co to cover any of your responsibilities that have to happen in the morning. Um, or you can move things around that don't have to happen in the morning. Um, and that way you can start to spend your mornings creating like you envision for your ultimate like five, 10 year kind of future. Um, so as I said, like this plan um, that you have, this vision for your future can change and almost certainly it will change. <laughs> it usually does. Um, you know, it's things like you suddenly hit your goal before you thought, you know, maybe you made that $60,000 by year four. <laughs> and so you're actually ready to update um, that number and kind of strive for more and get further. Um, or it can happen another way. You can realize that you're not actually inspired um, by what kind of goal it was. <coughs> so maybe um, you realize that like the mornings stink <laughs> and you can't actually seem to create anything good in the mornings. Um, so you would adapt your plan and you would say, all right, that's not working. The morning creation stuff isn't working. Um, so maybe I'm going to change that to middle of the day or to the evening or whatever I think might be the next thing to try and see if that works. And adapting that plan is actually really good. Um, it's not failure. It's actually progress. It's helping you um, get closer and closer to a business that you're going to really love um, and that you're, that's going to be really working as well. So now that you've got an overarching goal, um, and you've got a rough concept of benchmarks that can get you to that goal um, and or things that you can do like little by little to move towards your goal, um, depending on what that goal is. It's time to make sure that your systems are running smoothly. And um, this is where the systems part comes in. And I think some people are very scared by the term systems, um, but systems really just mean like ways to make things productive. Things that are repeatable is even a good way of putting it. Um, systems are really any any task that's repeatable and even that you do on multiple occasions. That isn't just a one-time thing. Um, I'm self confess I mean self-confessed systems struggler. I'm not good with systems. Um, but even with my difficulties with systems, um, I actually notice that when I do actually follow my systems, I'm more productive, like a lot more productive. Um, and then productivity reaps productivity. It's kind of a snowball effect. Um, if you start making progress, you're going to continue making progress, and then you'll be out of your rut. And, you know, ruts are what we're trying to get out of in this webinar. Um, so systems are really anything that's a reproducible task, like I said. Um, and if every blog post you write gets posted to Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, then that's a system. And if every time you get an inquiry from a potential customer and you put their name in, your, in the email address in a spreadsheet and then you mark down a date that you're going to follow up with them, that's also a system. And I'm sure that kind of makes sense. These are just things that you do over and over in your business. Um, and so your systems um, can be fine as they are. And some of them can be refined to work better. Um, so it's good to kind of notice where you're losing some time um, and try to, try to make those systems better. Um, like you can use Zapier, which I wrote down on the slide. Um, and Zapier connects services to each other. Um, and one of the things it can do is automatically post on Facebook and Twitter every time you have a new blog post go live. So you can set Zapier up to do all sorts of little things for you like that. Um, then there's CRM tools, which are um, customer relationship management systems, um, which is just a <laughs> big old term to say it's like task management and client management. 
um, and you have customers and not clients, and it kind of works the same for them, um, especially if you have repeat customers. Um, but they do call it client relationship management. Um, and you can use CRM software to keep track of your potential customers. And some in some certain softwares, you can have it automatically email you when the follow-up date is occurring. So you can like tell it, I want to follow up with Susie on Thursday about this custom order that she was talking about, but she hasn't quite you know, paid me yet. Um, so you can follow up on Tuesday and it'll send you an email so that you don't have to keep checking your little spreadsheet for when you're supposed to follow up with her. Um, and you can automate all sorts of things like this, and it'll make your systems um, take less of your time or even be more effective. Um, so I recommend that you review your systems at least twice a year. When you're in the early stages of business, it's really kind of best to do it once a quarter, um, because the more you refine your systems early on, the quicker you're going to end up with the best systems. And the best systems are, of course, going to be one of the best things you can do for your business. Um, the better the systems, the smoother your business is going to run. Um, so systems and goal setting is like a gigantic topic and there's plenty to learn. So if you get interested in it, um, feel free to go researching. Um, we're covering some of the main points. Um, and the one that I haven't gone over is really your day to day. Um, so Michaela and I want to talk to you. Um, you know, we know that these these aerial views are really helpful of this you know big goal of what you vision envision for your future. But it's kind of hard to distill that into what you're going to do um, on a day to day basis. You know, what is it going to look like in your normal life? So we want to make sure that we give you strategies for that, too. So now Michaela and I are going to both kind of talk a little bit about um, your daily creative pra practice. I can't talk today. And um, daily strategies, you know, that you're going to use um, that will help you along in business. Um, so, so, yeah, uh, so I'll jump in here. So uh, we're going to talk about the action gap. So that is one of the four gaps we looked at on the one of the first slides. And it's really all about what you're doing every single day, how you're putting everything into practice. So um, there were some really great tips that Laura gave on the knowledge gap. So um, I think that's really important and that's really taking a more strategic overarching view. And what we're looking at now is really about your daily creative practice and what you're doing every single day. So. I'm sorry, uh, the slides are going Sorry, through. I'm popping them back. Yeah, we've had a few issues with the slides today. So sorry about that for the jumping back and forth. Is that the one you wanna be on, Michaela? Uh, Yes. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, so yeah, so daily action is crucial, um, but you're probably wondering how. So what you really need to do is you need to craft a daily creative practice and you need to stick to it. And how are we going to do that? So next slide. Yes. Okay. So your daily creative practice. So what I recommend is to create for a set amount of time every single day and show up no matter what. Uh, so depending on your schedule, uh, it may be at the same time every day, it may not. Um, so I'd recommend if you don't have much time at minimum, at absolute minimum, uh, try to create for at least half an hour a day. Um, but some of you may have much more than that depending on your situation. I know some of you are in a full-time work situation at a day job, some of you are working part-time, and some of you are lucky enough to be full-time artists. So it's going to be different for everyone. Um, and I think the thing to remember is that as long as you're doing something every day, you are making progress and you are showing up and uh, being creative. And I think often as creators, we can get really down about ourselves when we feel like uh, we're not doing enough. So if you've only got half an hour to commit every day, uh, it may feel like not enough. It may feel like you're not being creative enough, you're not making enough progress. But I think it's really important to remember that you are making progress every single day. Um, and that's still great. And when you have more time, you can commit that. Maybe on the weekends, you can uh, commit a few more hours. But uh, whatever progress you make is perfect, as long as you're showing up every day and putting in your best efforts. Uh, the next point I'd like to talk about is inspiration. So I have a lot of people tell me who are struggling to get started or struggling to take things to the next level that they're not feeling inspired. Now, this is a really big problem because I think it's really easy to get into a bit of an inspiration rut 
uh, when you feel like you don't have any inspiration, you're not inspired, you can't create anything, you don't have any new ideas, nothing's coming to you. You've got a bit of a creative block, I guess, in a similar sense to a writer's block. If you're a writer, we might have some writers on the line, I'm not sure. So what I would say is don't wait for the inspiration to come. And I love this quote by Picasso. It's one of my most favorite artist quotes. Inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. So I guess what that means is that there is inspiration out there, but you need to do the work first. You need to be showing up every day and creating for that inspiration to find you. And I've found this to be very true in my own creative practice. So uh, we all have days when we don't feel like showing up, but um, even when I'm feeling like this, I like to make it a point to get out of the house, to go to my studio, and even if all I do is sit there, take out my materials, look at them, play with them, that is okay. That is still progress. So I would say that if you're finding yourself in a situation where the inspiration is lacking and you don't feel like showing up, show up anyway and just allow yourself to experiment and play and take the pressure off uh, because... When you put yourself under pressure, it actually makes it harder and harder and harder to do creative work. As we all know, uh, being creative is, is, is really quite amazing. You know, you're plucking an idea from your mind, uh, seemingly coming from nowhere, the culmination of all of your experiences, everything you've seen and heard percolating within your mind, and you're creating something new. So to put pressure on yourself in that situation, I find can often make things a lot worse. So sometimes you might just need to experiment and play and that is perfectly okay. And I would say that is still progress. And the last point on this slide is that ebbs and flows are natural. So everyone has ebbs and flows to their own creative work. So nothing is constant. We're not uh, you know, we're not looking at a mathematical graph with a with a constant productivity. That is not how things work, particularly not for creative people. So some days, some weeks, you may get more done. You may be in a wonderful creative flow and everything may be happening. And then the next week, it's completely different. So I'd encourage you to keep showing up every day and keep creating. I think that is the most most important thing to your daily creative practice, keep creating whether you're feeling inspired or not, you have to keep showing up. And um, if we go to the next slide now. Yeah, I want to jump in here on this point. Yeah. Um, that okay. I think it's, yeah. it's really actually very common for artists to have the ebbs and flows. And I don't think I even know a single artist who hasn't had a period of time where they like don't feel motivated. Um, and that you shouldn't, yeah, you definitely shouldn't feel bad about it. Um, and in fact, you should kind of embrace it because it's just part of the process. Um, and so, you know, go ahead and, and put in your creative practice time, you know, every day and just see what comes out and don't be embarrassed if it's like really crappy because plenty of artists, even like famous artists sure. have these long periods of time, you know, weeks, months, sometimes even like years where they don't make anything that they think is any good. You know, um, and that's fine. That's just part of what being an artist is like. Um, and the point is that you keep putting in the effort um, so that you don't lose this practice of creativity, which is really one of the major reasons why you're in business in the first place, you know, um, and you don't want to end up losing this practice and thus losing your passion so that your business is no longer something you enjoy. So here's the balancing act. Okay, so there's always a big balancing act between creating and working your art, and by that we mean your art business. Um, so I think Laura and I probably both have a few points to say on this, so I'll just say a few things and then I'll pass over to Laura. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I think is really important is setting goals for yourself and making them visible in your workspace. Um, and this goes, this goes for goals and this goes just for things that inspire you. So my studio walls uh, are filled with things that inspire me. They're filled with um, imagery that inspires me. They're filled with words. They're filled with goals. Um, they're filled with things that are going to help me do my best work. And by making them really visible in your workspace, um, you're allowing yourself to see them every day. You're soaking them up every day. They're impacting what you do. Um, and they become a really important part of your work. 
So I would encourage you to write your goals down and put them up in your space and make them doable. So I think uh, what Laura said before about looking at different time frames is really important as well when she talked about the income, income goals of setting a really big income goal for the future, maybe five years in advance, and that feels uh, like a really big goal to have today. And I think if the goal is too big, it's probably going to scare you more than inspire you. So break it down, I think is the best advice. And if you've got a really big goal for you know, the end of the year, perhaps, um, or end of next year or five years away, break it down and uh, break it down to what you're going to achieve this month. And then break that down to what you need to do this week to get it done. And I think just by setting those goals, you're really putting yourself on the right path because uh, you know what you have to do. So you've got the big goal guiding you. Maybe it's a big income goal. Maybe it might be a goal about exhibiting somewhere amazing or, or uh, something about your website in terms of getting a number of visitors or a certain number of email subscribers on your list. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. Write them down and then break them down so that you can see what you need to be doing this month, this week, and then even right down to today. So daily to-do lists and then taking them off and you're going to get a sense of satisfaction when you do that because you know that you're working towards the bigger goal. Um, so I'll pass over to Laura because I think she has a few things to yeah, say on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's um, this is a really big part of the presentation to pay attention to because we actually, uh, Michaela and I actually um, decided what to talk about in this arena um, separately and we both put um, the uh, making your goals visible in your workspace and using your goals to create daily to-do lists. We both had those on our lists. So they're like really important because we both thought it, of it that way. Um, with posting your goals um, in your workspace, I definitely wanted to take note that there is um, a money coach, I guess you would call her. Um, her name is Denise Stuffield Thomas, and some of you might know her. Um, and she actually touts this idea of changing your passwords, like on all your internet programs and things, um, to be you know a phrase that reminds you of your goal. Like if you wanted to um, earn three thousand dollars this month, then your passwords could all be changed to make 3000, you know, something like that. And I thought that was a really cool trick that I wanted to bring up. Um, because the point is to make your goals noticeable, not necessarily, you know, typing it up in a Word document with a fancy font, you know, it's not how you do it. Um, so much as making sure that you're remembering this goal on a daily basis, you don't want to forget your goal. And you also don't even want to ignore your goal, because you might remember your goal when like someone asks you what's your goal. But if it's not coming into your practice day to day, if it's not coming into you know, how you're seeing your business, then you're not going to remember to, to use that goal to make your decisions. And then you're not going to progress toward that goal. Um, so if you want it to be um, something that you're going to attain, it needs to be kind of present in your world on a daily basis. Um, I also wanted to talk about creating to-do lists um, from a little bit more of a technical perspective. Um, so... You can do you can do your daily to do lists in a bunch of different ways. Um, so I highly recommend you either you know if you know what how you like to have it done that's fine, um, and if you don't, kind of experiment with it and see what works for you, and don't be afraid to um, to try something and then abandon it if it's not working well. Um, you want to create um, you want to use those goals that we talked about from like your big vision and then kind of like distilling that down to kind of manageable ideas, you want to actually put that into daily tasks, um, which are really like tiny bite-sized chunks, like small bites, little delicate bites, not huge bites. Um, so like in your head, your task might be to kind of update the, the text on your website, all the copy. You want to update that. That's like a really overwhelming task. <laughs> That's kind of scary. It's much better to have tasks that are like update the headlines on the homepage. And another task could be rewrite the section of my about page that goes through my education and experience. Um, you know, little little tasks like that, little things that are, that are bite-sized, tiny pieces of what you have to do. Um, they're easier for us to wrap our heads around, and so they're more likely to get done, um, which is a kind of a mental trick. Um, you can also use, use tools to track your different um, to-do lists, which I think is very helpful. You can you can also write them on pieces of paper, which is fine. And if that works for you, you know, great. Keep doing what you're doing. 
Um, but if you're having trouble and you're not being able to get your, your lists done and you don't or you're not even knowing what to put on the list, um, then having a tool can actually be really helpful. Um, so this can be something techy, um, like there are um, various task management software like Asana or Rike or Trello, um, and you can kind of just search Google for task management and find just hundreds of them um, and pick one that you know appeals to you. Um, I definitely suggest for big projects that you work out the entire thing ahead of time, whether that's on a tool, on a tech tool, um, or if it's on paper. Um, I think, you know, as much as you can possibly figure out every step that's going to go into your big project, you should. Um, so, you know, take a couple hours even. It might take you like half a day <laughs> and just write down all the tasks that you kind of foresee already that need to happen. And you can categorize them. Um, and if you aren't using a tech tool, uh, my favorite way to keep track of them all is to actually put them on note cards. Um, each of your note cards can list smaller tasks that have to happen. Um, so, uh, for example, your whole category could be marketing. Um, so one of the note cards is going to say Facebook ad. <laughs> and, you know, your big project's marketing, I guess, is how I was putting it before. Um, so one of your note cards in your, you know, big project of marketing says Facebook ad on it. Um, and on that note card, you have tinier things. And those things are, you know, little bullet points that are like, write the headline, create the graphic, decide who to target, set the budget, which are all aspects of putting together a Facebook ad. But they're small, easy to accomplish tasks, rather than going into the Facebook ad editor and looking at this wall of crazy questions and being like, what am I supposed to do? You know, they're very simple step by step things. So you want all these tasks that are on your note cards to be really easy to accomplish, really tiny. Um, that note card system, you know, you don't have to use it, but I think it gives you the ability to focus on one area at a time. You, know, you pull out one note card and you can see what things still need to happen um, or you can celebrate your accomplishments, which is also fun. You know, if you've crossed something off the list, you can visually see that you crossed it off the list. And a lot of the tech tools that you have um, don't show you the things you've already accomplished. Um, so it's kind of nice for that. Um, but if you are using a tech tool, that's fine too. I typically use tech tools most of the time. And you probably have the ability to do the same kind of categorization there. You know, there's usually like categories, tasks, subtasks. Sometimes they have different um, names in different software. Um, but it's the same idea that you have these different levels um, that you can use. Um, and there, there's also extra features in these tech tools. So sometimes there's um, a, a greater reason to use a tech tool because it has a feature that you can't really get on paper, um, like being able to see what tasks are dependent upon another task being accomplished. Um, that's a really great thing. You can also tag tasks in a lot of the software so that you could um, put a tag that's like, you know, everything that has to do with this one person. Um, you know, one customer or something like that. And then you can search for that tag. And so all the tasks come up for that one person's step. Um, so things like that are really helpful. Um, I highly recommend having a tech tool for at least the basic broad categories so that you can see your progress at a glance. And you can also clue in um, your like freelancers, the people that you've outsourced to that are helping you. Um, you can kind of clue them into the general concept, the general structure of the projects that you're working on. Um, or you can show them, you know, where where they come in in the scheme of things. Um, so I think that's usually really helpful. Um, but you don't have to use a tech tool and you don't have to use paper. You can choose what works for you. Um, and that's the best way I find to track your progress is, you know, picking something, experimenting with it, seeing if it feels good and then sticking with it, <laughs> whether it be techie or written. Okay. So as we've talked about in this webinar, the key to achieving the next level um, in your art business is really just tackling these gaps. And so it's really as simple as, you know, figuring out which gap you're struggling with and really addressing, you know, the belief gap, the knowledge gap, or the action gap. Um, and so now I think we want to proceed to questions. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my webcam again. Um, Michaela, did you have anything else you wanted to add to the presentation? Um, so just, just on the last slide, I would just say, um, think about these three big areas and 
consider in your own work, what area are you struggling with most? So is it the knowledge gap? Is it the action gap? Or is it the belief gap? Or maybe it's a combination of all three. Um, yeah, we'll get there. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to really think about that because I think often, you know, it might, it might just be one area you're struggling with. I see a lot of uh, creators at all levels struggling with belief. So that's a really big one. I think most of you um, would have some problems with belief. Um, then I think uh, there's also, um, in terms of the knowledge gap, particularly if you're an artist or a creative person that is early on in their creative career, I think often the knowledge gap is a really big one and it can be um, definitely very confusing at first when you're first starting out to get your head around all of this. So um, it's really great that Laura has gone over all of that today because that's definitely her area of expertise and she suggested some really great tools for you guys. Um, and then the action gap, which I think is relevant to everyone in some way. So some of you may have better systems in place for dealing with that at the moment, but some of you might be really struggling with uh, showing up to your creative work every day um, and really setting those goals and working out those daily to-do lists and having a way to manage all of that. So um, I think thinking about which area you're struggling with um, and if you have a question for us, we would be happy to answer those. So if you see in the question box, you can type the question in and click send privately. And that will just send that to Laura and I. So if anyone has any questions, just type them in now. So we already have some, um, and I apologize profusely for whatever is going on with the slides that's making them unable to pause. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave yes. it like that. Not sure that's what's happening there. Okay, and I will turn my web camera on now as oh, well. Oh, right. Here we go. <laughs> we should have those on um, so everybody can see us. Um, yeah. So. Um, Laura, I can't see the questions. So I'll, I'll read them out. To read them out. Yeah. So we have um, one from John, and he says that artists steal ideas all the time. Picasso suggested it, which is very true. Um, Picasso was a big proponent of stealing. Um, and he, he suggested it in the sense of gaining ideas from other artists. It's part of legitimate art. Just give the credit. Um, it's not really, it's really not literally stealing, but adopting someone else's ideas. Where would art be without such? I think that's a good point, John. <laughs> Where would it be if we didn't take inspiration from others? <laughs> um, let's see, Stella. Um, Stella's just saying that she had to go, um, but she was loving it. So she can catch the recording. Um, Sally is asking, what are some good tech tools for task management? So I, I can cover that. Or if Michaela, if you have anything that you use personally, that's great too. Um, I've got a few tips as well. So Laura, you go first and then I'll jump in after you. Sure. Um, so I like Trello and I like Asana and they're kind of a different um, feeling when you look at them, uh, but they can pretty much do about the same things. Trello is a little bit more visual, so I think it tends to work better for creatives. But if you really need something super straightforward and like, you know, really easy, really like this is how it is, very to the point. Um, then I think Asana is a little bit better because it's more businessy, I guess. Um, and that can sometimes be better if you really need to like focus in and it just have like a list of tasks. What do you have, Michaela? Okay, um, so I probably have two tools. Um, so one is super simple. Um, I simply, to, to manage my own tasks on a day-to-day -day basis, I use my iPhone. So I'm not sure how many of you have iPhones or different smartphones that can do this. So I find it great. So I just use the notes section. Um, it's perfect because I have it everywhere with me. I've always got my phone on me and it syncs up to all of your other devices. So you've, um, if, you're, if you've got an iPhone and you're using a Mac at home, or perhaps if you've got an Android and you're using a PC, that can sync. So I know that as soon as I come home, connects through the Wi-Fi, my notes get sent to the computer and they get sent to the iPad. So wherever I am, I've always got that task list and it's automatically updated. So um, I used to be a, a pen and paper kind of girl and I still am when I'm at home and I'm drafting out kind of big plans like Laura was talking about um, but I find the electronic notes are perfect because um, unlike a piece of paper you can't lose it or 
um, you know, not be able to find it at the right time. It can be hard to remember to bring something everywhere with you. But um, given how much we all use mobile phones, I find it perfect just to use that app. It's really simple. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't do um, you know all of that kind of. Uh, higher level task management stuff that Laura was talking about, but if you're just looking for something really simple, I just encourage you to start using that. Um, another great tool which I have used in the past when working on projects, particularly with other people, is Basecamp. Um, so this is a product by 37 Signal. Some of you might have heard of them. They're a uh, very well-known tech company um, who make a lot of really great, easy-to-use products. Um, and Basecamp basically lets you manage tasks and projects and lets other people come on board with those projects. So it could be particularly good, I'm guessing, if you're working with a freelancer or you've hired someone, which Laura was talking about with outsourcing, and getting them onto a program like Basecamp because you can really easily manage tasks between different people, you can assign things, you can see progress, you can also upload files. So it can be the perfect way to do that because I know that um, when you're dealing by email, it can get really messy with those types of situations oh, yeah. in terms of, um, you know, finding everything you need to find. Um, in fact, it probably would have been great for Laura and I in organizing this webinar today. If we yeah, had I hadn't earlier. even considered so, it. <laughs> yeah, neither had I. So we're not taking our own advice, but you definitely should. So <laughs> yes. um, I, <laughs> I don't have experience with the um, with the apps that Laura suggested, but I have heard them recommended by other people. So I guess, you know, it, it all depends what works for you. So um, mm -hmm. look into your options. We'll send links out to all of these tools uh, when we send out the recording so that you can yeah. easily check them all up. No need to try to write them all down now. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm, actually Google's kind of your best friend with this because they put the, um, the results for the for the sites that are used the most, um, which usually means that they're better, they put those at the top. So it's actually really easy to just Google and be like, you know, task management, and it'll come up Definitely. with like the best ones right at the top. So you can check out the ones that you know um, are at least proven by how many people use them, and then you can yeah. kind of test what works. Um, in the questions, uh, Volante, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, she also recommended Evernote, um, which okay. is a program that Another I use as well too. And um, it stores really almost anything. It can store pictures, it can store links, it can store like snippets of web pages and things. And it's got a nice little structure for categorizing um, into like separate notebooks is like what they call them. So that's a really good one, um, especially if you've got a lot of ideas. I know some artists who use them for um, concepts for their different art pieces, you know, as pieces are in the works and they're doing research and stuff. Um, what I like about Evernote as well is that it does sync so you can get an app for your phone if you've got a smartphone yeah. you can have it on your computer you can have it on every device um, which is great and also I believe um, there's a plugin that you can use so when you're online you can automatically just click uh, one button when you're on a website mm -hmm. and it automatically sends um, the page and the information to Evernote which is makes it really simple if you're doing research. Yeah good point because it definitely does do um, both of those things which is awesome. <laughs> Um, I probably should use it more. <laughs> so uh, Sharif wants to know, is it a good idea to make a quick website like Wix.com just for now until I can pay for one to sell my art? So um, from my perspective, I yes. yeah, I would say yes too. Um, I think that having a website to start with is like the most important thing. Um, you might have to do some reworking when you get a different website, um, especially if you use a different yeah. domain name. It might be a little bit of trouble there, but it's better to have something up than nothing. Don't you think, Michaela? I think if you can, if you can, yeah, I think so. If you can definitely start with your own custom domain name, I think that's the most important thing. Work out what you want your site to be called and buy your own domain. So I think mm -hmm. it's as cheap as five or $10 a year um, to buy your domain name. So it's definitely worthwhile investment. And I think, uh, you know, it's okay to have um, a not so great design or a not perfect design at the start because you can always change that. Um, but a domain is probably something you don't want to change if you don't have to um, because over time you're going to build up links and referral traffic uh, to that domain and you're also going to build up um, legitimacy with Google which is going to help your Google ranking for um, yeah. click-throughs from Google. So I'd say that's the one thing you want to pin down right now, your domain name choose something which is going to be relevant to you long term 
for your work. Um, and then, yeah, go create a website with Wix as long as you can have a custom domain. I definitely agree with that. Um, and Wix is a pretty easy one to use. So, you know, that's um, if anybody else on the call um, has trouble with building a website um, or it's daunting, uh, Wix has just now taken off the requirement to use Flash. So um, pretty much anything that I had against Wix is gone. So you should now be able to use Nobody Wix likes Flash. and really enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, no one likes Flash, which you might not all know, but um, Flash is a certain type of coding that wouldn't show up on mobile devices. Um, and then it was a pain in the butt for even um, desktops and laptops. It, it didn't work very well um, for everyone, so <laughs> definitely not recommend it. Um, but Wix is good now. They don't use Flash anymore. Um, so Gustavo says thank you for the call. And he wanted to ask us what artist database software we use for context, art inventory, that kind of thing. Um, he mentions that he's used Artbase and Gist in the past. Um, so I know I have a fair amount of experience with that. I've looked into a number of things. Um, I really like Flick, which um, is by Arawak, I think is the name of the company. Um, when you go to download it, the website looks kind of like shoddy and you're thinking, is this, you know, okay? But it really is, it's okay to download. Um, and I have it on my computer and I like, I like it. It's not um, very visually appealing, but it has most of the things that you need. Um, and then a client actually just queued me into um, one that she uses and it's called, let me see if I can, FileMaker Pro. It's called FileMaker Pro and um, it's used for all sorts of industries, but it's very customizable. So you can definitely use it for art. And she says she's got herself almost set up um, and it didn't take her very long to do. It was a little bit more complicated, a little bit more techy. Um, so probably not for you if that stuff scares you. Um, but there are some like courses out there if you want to learn how to use it. And it's very customizable. So if you have um, a particular medium where you might need a little bit more help, um, a little bit a more fields that wouldn't be in a typical database um, for artists, like there, you can easily put in whatever fields you want. Um, Michaela, do you have any experience with these? No, I don't. I don't. So I am glad you could answer that question. So what is it? A artist database? Yeah, it keeps track of like your your different pieces and you know where they are, how much they cost, different specifics oh, about them. Right. Okay. And um, a lot no, of them I also haven't. Track of, keep track of your contacts, um, your customers, your gallerists, things like that. Okay. Yeah. So I have, I have experience with a, I guess it's more of a CRM. Is it a CRM that uh, he's it, referring to? Kind of. Um, yeah. They're sort okay. of CRMs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a CRM I've used in the past is high rise, um, which is really easy to use. It doesn't manage, it doesn't manage your art, but if you're looking for something just to manage your contacts and a really simple system for that, um, I would recommend high rise. And that's by the same people that make base camps. So that's the, Mm -hmm. 30, 37 signals people um, that's really easy to use and you can also track um, there's a functionality in there for tracking deals so you can track um, how, like dollar values on how much art um, you're selling and so it's, I think it's a really good system for that and it's definitely really easy to use it's very user friendly so I would recommend that if you don't need to keep track of actual individual pieces yeah yeah, I definitely agree with you on that, um, which I guess would be good for people who just don't have all that many pieces to track, which can be a lot of people, yeah. um, especially if you're selling on a regular basis and so things are moving really quickly. So at any given point in time, you don't have all that many pieces. Yeah. Um, so Sally said, thank you. Then we have Takesha and Takesha says, how do you better, how do you better your craft by not always trying to be perfect with your work and comparing with others? So Michaela, that's totally your topic. Okay. Um, so, so, sorry, can you read the question again, Laura? Yeah. How do you better your craft by not always trying to be perfect with your work and comparing with others? Okay. I mean, I, I guess that's a tough question because there's always, there's always going to be a bit of a balance here. Um, and I guess when I went through my tips for perfectionism, I said things like make a conscious mistake, put it out there um, when it's not perfect. And I think that can be really hard to do. Um, and I think there is still there is still improvement in that. There is still improvement allowed. I think if you are creating every day, 
even if you are putting something out there that is not 100% for you, it is, you are still going to be making progress in your art every day. And I think that progress is still happening. I think the tips for perfectionism are really about letting go of that obsession. So it's not about not improving. It's about not being obsessed, not being as obsessed to the point where you aren't progressing, where it's becoming a really negative energy type of thing for you. But within that, I think it's still important to set internal goals. So not looking as much at what other people are doing, what other artists are doing and feeling envious of that, but setting personal goals for yourself. So this is where it comes back to um, some of the tips Laura and I gave for the goal setting and the daily creative practice and look at where you want to be. So um, not about being perfect, but um, like Laura mentioned, what does your ideal day look like? Not what does the ideal day of an perfect artist in a perfect world look like, but what does your ideal day look like? Um, and I think as creative people, it is often really easy to get really envious and think that person has an amazing studio and they've got full time to commit to their art. They don't have to, they don't have to work another job. They don't have, maybe they don't have family commitments. They don't have all of these other things going on. And um, you're looking at them and thinking, if only I had that, things could be perfect. But um, we all have our own lives and we all have our own constraints. So think about what your perfect day would be to you. So maybe it would just be a morning, you know, one full morning to create every week and strive towards that. Or maybe it would be, um, you know, just to make a few thousand dollars from your art this year if you're not making money yet. Or if you are making money, maybe it's to up that by, you know, maybe it's to double what you did last year. Um, so I'd really try to look more within rather than looking outside to compare because I think if you compare yourself to someone else, um, you're really getting wrapped up in, in, in a, a different notion of success. So you're getting wrapped up in what their success is and what that means to them and you're getting wrapped up in a conventional, you know, what should an artist achieve to be successful. So I think um, it's important to dig really deep within yourself, maybe do that activity that Laura suggested of uh, just taking out a piece of paper, just giving yourself like a whole hour, um, sitting down nice and relaxed, maybe make a cup of tea or something. And um, just imagine what would my perfect creative day look like? What would my perfect creative week look like? Um, mm -hmm. and, and really go from there. And then when you're working daily, I think, you know, it is important to be setting goals. It is important to be achieving goals. And what we're avoiding with the perfectionist tendency is the obsession. It's not the progress. It's the obsession that we're avoiding. Um, so as long as it, it remains a positive thing for you, it's okay. When it borders into the obsessive negative energy part, that's when it's not okay. That's when you need to make the conscious mistake on your work and just put it out there, take the photo and get it up online. Otherwise, it's, it's never going to end. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps answer your question. I think that sounded great. Um, let's see other questions. Gustavo and Lisa Marie said thank you. And then Daniel has a question. He asks, Daniel asks, I have a YouTube channel. How do I make it progress? And I think that's a very, very loaded question that could have its own webinar. Um, <laughs> so I'll just touch on that a little bit and I'll let Michaela touch on it too. Um, that it's important to be posting regularly. Um, if you have a YouTube channel, you want to post videos on your YouTube channel. Um, and you want them to be videos that appeal to your customers. Um, so, you know, don't talk about your dog if your customers aren't pet people, you know, mm -hmm. um, very, you know, basic stuff, but this can sometimes be something that trips us up. So make sure that um, if your customers are the type that are really interested in what's going on with you behind the scenes, that's the sort of thing you talk about. You give them a studio tour, you show them works in progress, um, things like that. If they're interested, and what's going on in the art world, like the like capital letters art world, like in New York and Milan and stuff like that. Um, then you give them insights into what's happening in that world. You, tell, you talk about the news and what you think about it and things like that. So make sure you're in touch with your customers um, and that you're posting videos regularly. Um, and then share the link, um, which I think is one we always miss. Like YouTube doesn't perpetuate itself um, unless your video happens to go viral. Um, and so you have to actually share your videos um, with, with people outside of YouTube. Um, so yeah, post that link. Michaela, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I have a couple of things probably 
just in terms of search, like a few things you can do. Um, so I, I actually, I originally came from the marketing world, so um, I, I know quite a bit about SEO and all of that. I don't know if um, you know the callers on here are familiar, but it's basically all about um, uh, helping Google know that you exist and increasing your rankings there. Um, and getting that natural traffic can be a really great, um, you know, source of leads. Um, but it is something that takes time. Um, so um, changes that have been made recently have really made YouTube videos much more important and they do rank quite highly in Google. Um, so you can really take advantage of that um, by putting uh, certain words in your description. So make sure you fill out those video descriptions. Make sure you've got a URL back to your website so that you're, you're directing people um, back to your channel where you're selling, wherever you're selling, whether it's your website or Etsy or Big Cartel, any other domain you're selling on. Uh, make sure you're directing people back there um, and make sure you're using the right words in your description. So think about uh, what we call keywords. Think about what keywords your customers might be searching for. So I'm, uh, without knowing what kind of art or creative work you do, um, maybe just make a big list and write down every single word that someone like a like a like a regular person might use to describe what you do so um, you know if you do abstract painting maybe you know it would be painting abstract art abstract painting um, and a whole lot of words I probably can't think of right now to describe um, what someone might be typing in when they're looking for that um, and really work them into your description both in terms of the name of the video um, and the description box that YouTube gives you and make sure you put your URL there and I think that is really going to help over time like it's not going to give you a flood of uh, visitors all at once but if you make that uh, a process I guess it's a system like Laura was talking about if you make that part of your system every time yes, you put is. up a YouTube video, <laughs> every time you put up a YouTube video, you do that, that's on your list of things to do. I think that's that's gonna start to pay off over time. Mm -hmm. It is a system, systems are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, that was good advice. I actually didn't even know everything that you said in that, so okay. super helpful. Cool. Thanks, Michaela. <laughs> um, so Julie says, thank you. And then uh, Latasha said, uh, Michaela, that was awesome about perfectionism and comparison. Um, she was awesome. really liked that. Um, Great. I'm glad you found it useful. And that looks like it for now. If anybody else has any questions, this is kind of your last chance. Um, we went way over the time. I think we both expected. Yes. <laughs> so um, I guess we had a lot to say. <laughs> so go ahead yeah. and uh, throw those those questions in if you still have any. Um, Daniel says, thanks. Oh, and Daniel says, greetings from Venezuela. So he is Hello. talking from afar. <laughs> Which I guess is very far for both Michaela and I, because Michaela's in Australia and I'm in the US. So very widespread across the world on this <laughs> call today. It's truly international. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, that looks like it. I don't see any more questions coming through. So um, I think we can wrap up for today. Did you have anything else you wanted to leave everybody with, Michaela? Um no, just thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many of you showing up live on the call. Thank you for asking your questions. I think it's always really valuable when people ask questions because it adds a it adds a really different dimension to the whole webinar and really teases out some things that um, you know we may have missed or um, you know not gone as in depth as you guys wanted. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been really great today, and I would just encourage you over the next few days to really think about those gap areas and. Think about uh, where you might where you might be missing uh, one of those gaps in your creative work and how you can really um, help build those to get further. Absolutely, um, and we'll send out the recording um, in the next couple days. Um, so if there's anything that you feel like you want to revisit, um, that'll be available to you pretty soon here. All right, thank you everybody. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the presentation. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming, guys. Bye.